That's great. Hey guys, it's Eric from foundersbeta.com and I'm very delighted to have uh, two startup speakers tonight talking about product development. Uh, we have Stepan from Montreal joining us and we have Ashney from Waterloo. So um, yeah, so we'll be diving into the questions and uh, talking about how to build products that uh, people love to use. We all have those uh, you know, products that we use on a daily basis and we love them. And sometimes you can't even live without them. Uh, so we'll be chatting about all things about product development. Um, so uh, before that, let's dive into your backgrounds a little bit. Um, so maybe Ashley, can you talk about uh, how you got to where you are today? Sure thing. Uh, so hey, everyone. Uh, nice to have you here with us, I guess. Um, I'm Ashni. I originally grew up in Kenya and I moved to Canada about seven years ago when I started university. Uh, two years ago, I graduated. I graduated with a degree in computer science. So my background is all in computer science and software development. And uh, for the last two years, I've been working as a software engineer in two different companies. Uh, previously, Microsoft and I'm currently working at Square. Um, in my free time for the last year and a half, I've also been running Elixir Labs, which is a nonprofit startup that partners with other nonprofits around the world to build technical solutions for them. And um, I, through that entire experience, as well as my work experience at Square and Microsoft, I've touched on a lot of other product development kind of, um, kind of things as well. Excellent. That, that sounds exciting. So it looks like you're really involved in the tech scene in Waterloo, but also working on a startup too. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, Stefan, can you tell us about your background and experience? Yeah, definitely. So my name is Esteban and uh, yeah, I came from mostly engineering and an, an entrepreneur background. Like I started the programming when I was 12. I started my first company a few years later. So I've always been kind of, kind of in startups. And uh, I, I worked a lot on Volume 7, an agency uh, where we helped dozens of startups like create their MVP and build a uh, product and bring it to market. And right now I've been focusing a lot on Commutify. It's a new startup uh, in the mobility space. We raised around 1.5 million to date. We're a team of 10 and we're a yeah, lot of exciting development. I'm leading all uh, the tech and the product for the company. Awesome. That's so exciting. Um, okay. So let's talk about, uh, before we chat about product development, how about, uh, let's talk about validating business ideas. So, you know, before you go out there, build that amazing product, you know, um, how do you go about validating a business idea? Is it going out of the building? What, what do you, um, what do you recommend for startups to do? Uh, so maybe, Actually, no, no, oh, it's the no. okay, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or, or, yeah, but uh, I see that like there's a few mistakes that I, I see all the time. And one of them is uh, people validate only with their family and friends. I've seen right. many entrepreneurs go to their family, their friends, and everyone say it's a great idea, do it. But they will never tell you if it's a bad idea. Right. Uh, so I think it's validating with actual customers. And there's a few good ways, like you can build just a landing page. Like there's tons of landing page builders, uh, put a, just sign up as a beta tester or anything just to create engagement. It's always the best form of validation. If a customer say, I'll give you my email or even better, I'll give you a prepayment. Although <laughs> that's often hard, right. that's the best form of validation. But otherwise just uh, like sometimes creating a prototype on Envision, uh, like a clickable design prototype, showing it around to potential customers or just to random people that doesn't know you so you can get more direct feedback. Right. I, I think that's so true. I also see it in startups too. You go out to your friend and they love it. They're like, oh, you know, it's going to be great. But when you actually build it, it's like nobody wants to use your product, right? So Yeah, and that's uh, before investing uh, three months to build a product, it's right. good to take an extra week to make sure it's the right thing. For yeah. sure. Ashley, what are your thoughts on this one? Well, I was going to add on to that. Um, I think it's extremely important to reach outside of your network, outside of the people you regularly interact with. Um, one way to do that is to network at different kind of tech events, because that's a good way to sort of pitch your idea to other people who are in the tech industry, who are still somewhat related to your network, but they understand the technology. And um, they will, you know, if, if your idea is something that 
has happened before, they may already be aware of it. But then to also figure out who exactly your customer is and make sure you're interacting with your customer. Because let's say you're building an app for patients with um, schizophrenia, which is a project I did a few years ago. I can't go to my family and like Esteban uh, mentioned, I can't go to my family and say, hey, do you think this is a good idea? Unless someone in my family has schizophrenia uh, because they're not going to understand the same problems or they're not going to be able to interact with it the same way. Right, right. That, that makes a lot of sense. I think uh, talking about uh, talking to people, basically you don't know because they're going to give you unbiased feedback. And I think that's uh, probably the most important thing you want to hear about, right? Um, and I think having something out there too really helps like a landing page, you know, some kind of a maybe a prototype without actually, you know, having to go out there, build it. Uh, so I think that's, that's really critical. Um, so I think those are great pointers. And, to, and maybe even to add to that, sometimes you can even run your business manually. I mean, like if, let's say your business is something, let's say urban B connecting people who rent with people who get an apartment, nothing stops you from creating a Facebook community, a Slack group or whatever it is, and try to just run your business manually for a week, two weeks, a month, just to see if there traction? Do I need to automate it? Build yeah, product? Exactly. Yeah. I think that's also a great tip because uh, I think uh, without actually investing that a whole lot of time on product development, you can also get a sense of interest. I think uh, those are great way. Like a Slack group too, it's great because you can start seeing how many people are going to join if anyone is interested even, right? Um, so I think that's great. Awesome. Let's move on to the next question. Um, let's talk about, uh, you know, what's called MVP. So minimal viable product. Uh, so, you know, that's the first version of your product. You know, you got the idea, you went out there. You know, what, had, what makes a great MVP? So I think one of the first things that you need to do when you're working on your MVP is taking all the feedback you've been given in that initial phase of validating your idea and seeing the parts that people were most interested in, because you'll only get people interested in your product if there's something in it for them. And what's interesting for me might not be what's interesting for my customers, for the people who are going to be using it at the end. So when you take a list of what those most interesting things are, um, narrow it down to the ones that you need to, that you can build in a reasonable amount of time and that are enough of, to provide you a foundational project and build that up as your MVP. And then from there you can continue iterating, get the feedback and then build on top of that. Great. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's great because I think a lot of times, you know, startups, you just work on the features you want, right? <laughs> but not necessarily looking at the end user. So, uh, and I've been there too. It's like, oh, I really like this. But it's like, then you go out, it's like nobody's even using it. Stefan, any ideas on that? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, uh, people get too excited about their own product. We, we did the same mistake like three years ago. We engineered a great platform, six months of work. Uh, all the algorithms were perfect. And we realized in one month after lunch, this whole thing was not what the customer wanted. We could have oh, discovered that in two months and save it faster. Right. Uh, there's, there's that quote I really like. It's uh, from, I think, the LinkedIn founder, Reed Huffman, is if you're, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you launch too late. Right. And that really says it. It's, uh, yeah, as uh, Ashley said, just focus on whatever provides value for the consumer. And it's it can even have a lot of manual work. Like sometimes uh, you might need a nice interface, you might need some consumer facing stuff, but like if you need a, an algorithm in the back end, can you do it manually for now? Like you won't have a thousand customers or 10,000 customers on day one. So focus on what the customers see and leave the rest to do later. Yeah, I guarantee you that list of what you think you're building and what you actually build are going to change within version two. Yeah. And just touching on something that Esteban mentioned as well, if you're working with a specific uh, set of clients um, to build out your product or to be your, your initial set of testers, get that prototype to them as early as possible and make sure that they're able to actually see and visualize what you're building. Because if I tell you A, you're going to hear B and we're going to end up with C and no one's going to be happy in that scenario. Right. Yeah, I think that's so true. It's, it's great to have something that actually like works or even like, like, you know, it could be something as scrappy as, as it gets, right? But as long as you have something to show for, I think that's, that's really critical. Um, great. 
Um, so let's move on to the next question. Um, so we know like, you know, having those early users are critical beta testers. How do you find beta testers for your, you know, first version of the product? Esteban, I'll let you take this away. So my, <laughs> my subset of people that I interact with is slightly different than I can see. <laughs> yeah. yeah, perfect. So, but yeah, I said there's, I see there's two big bunch. Like for now in this one, friends and family are always useful, but mostly for bugs. Like if you just want the users using your product, finding bugs, anyone that's close to you and wants to give us a bit of time is useful. Just getting 10, 15 extra pair of eyes using your product, they'll discover flows that like you'll be when you test you'll always be testing the same way and then they'll do random things that you didn't expect and find bugs so that's kind of the first level now if you want beta testers to validate that the prototype is the right thing the ux is fine then go to your customers if you build a landing page if you have early subscribers whatever it is uh, go to them as ashley said earlier get them a prototype in their hand as soon as possible you also, you also want to start integrating into that first phase that you mentioned, um, or actually between the first and second phase, you want to start looking at maybe adding a reward type system to try and get your, get your early customers to convince their friends to join in as well. Um, so the reason I mentioned that my, my user group are usually slightly different is because my end customers are nonprofits. Right. Oh, That's um, always challenging, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a very different group of people right. that I'm interacting with. Um, but from my experience as a software engineer and from what I've seen um, working with the project managers and all the other interactions that we have within our companies, um, it's, you know, if you, if you continue to iterate on uh, the feedback that you're getting and, you know, listen to your customers, um, that's a really good way to uh, build a product that they're going to like. But when it comes to building up that initial customer base, when you, create that landing page, you definitely want to start collecting information from them. So that's, you know, their email address. So you can send out constant updates or send out a, Ooh, here we have an exclusive private beta program for you to apply to be the first one to get your hands on it. Um, and then some other, some other companies or startups that I think have done a really good job is creating like a private beta based on a referral system are companies like Robin hood, where it turns into a sort of gamification process of trying to, up your entry level into the system because you need to um, invite other friends and that'll bump you up in the queue and stuff. Granted, you need to have a big enough user base for that to work, but it's, it's a way to build it up. And it's a marketing technique at the same time. Exactly. It's all about that, marketing at that point. That's, that's so true. And I think the beauty of those having those reward system or even some kind of incentive for the user too is you know, by the time you launch, like you already have 10,000 users, right? Whereas I see that in, a, in the startups, it's a lot of times you build it, you know, you go out there, you're like, oh, who wants to use this product? You know, you didn't really market it well. Versus like, you know, building that initial user base, whether it's like 100 people, 200, that gives you a bit of advantage. Versus like, you know, you already build it, but it's like, okay, where can I find the users? You don't want to be asking that questions, right? Then. Um, so yeah, definitely. Those, those are very good pointers. Uh, in terms uh, maybe, of, uh, maybe to add on that, it's not how to find beta testers, but make sure to spend just a bit of time, like even if it's a day, adding analytics to your product uh, before using beta, beta testers. They'll tell you, hey, I didn't like that, or whatever they'll tell you. If you can uh, analyze that in parallel with your analytics, it can be like there's heat maps, there's a way to track the user flow. There's a lot of analytics that are easy to implement that will help you learn a lot more about the behavior of these early beta testers. Right. And, and tied into um, the analytics portion, if you can actually do some behavioral tests where you go and find maybe five or 10 random people who never interacted with your product before and just give it to them and say, hey, if, you know, if it's a peer to -pay, peer payment app, I want you to send me $5 and just see how they interact with the app and how quick and easy it is for them to figure it out. Yeah. If you have that analytics in it, you can also identify which areas they got stuck in and see if it's in common trend with other people as well. Right, yes, I think that, that that makes a lot of sense. I think even for landing pages, something as simple as a Google Analytics, right? Seeing how much traffic it's getting, where it's coming from, user behavior, I think like what Stepan says, that's also key. So I think those are excellent. Uh, okay, so let's talk about feedback. You know, we hear like you have a product and you go to customers and you hear like, 
from the customers. Can you build me this X, Y, and Z? You get this, you know, how do you manage those like kind of early on feedback um, from your potential users? Uh, go ahead. Uh, sure. Um, so I think some of the early feedback when I'm getting it from, uh, let's say the friends, family, and like the initial people that I'm showing it off to, they're usually more positive in terms of they understand that I'm trying to build something good and they're not all about, you know, shutting, shutting the idea down. Um, so, so I, I would trust their opinions a lot more because they are the early adopters who I've usually reached out to and said, Hey, this is, this is what I want to build. And this is my first implementation of it. And more likely than not, you're going to get a lot of really great feedback in there and you have to go and mentally figure out what exactly it is that they're trying to say, because a lot of, a lot of, friends and family, especially my family, um, are not the same uh, or, or don't have the same sort of technical levels as I do. Right. So it's be like, oh, this button is funny. Um, you need to go and analyze and try to figure out what exactly that means. Um, as you start expanding into uh, the wider range of people and uh, or like your bigger customer base and you start getting feedback from them, you want to you wanna try to use your analytics to identify, okay, there's this one user who's consistently saying, I want this feature, I want this feature, but they're the only user that says that. They're, they just happen to be the loudest person. Right. Whereas, whereas you know, if you were checking your analytics and 90% of your other users don't even touch that part of your app, there's no point going and spending all of those resources on that feature when it's very evident if you're looking at your analytics that there's other features that, are, that would probably serve you better and serve your customers better as well. Right. Yeah, definitely. I think it's uh, that's a good point you're touching. I think it's uh, like the 90 slash 10 rule. It's uh, focus on the flows that bring value to 90% of your users. So always try to make sure that this feedback applies to most use case and not to an edge case. And if so, just keep it like a Trello board, whatever, a Google Doc. Just keep it, keep notes of them. And when you see them coming like as a recurring thing, then you know, oh, the feedback might be important. But uh, yeah, that, that's one thing to touch a bit. You talked about customers not being as technical. Uh, I definitely <laughs> agree with that. Too. It's don't ask the customer what he wants. He doesn't know what he wants, or if he knows, uh, he's not the one innovating for your product. Ask him what his problems are. And try, right. if, you, if you can figure out what problems, what challenges he's having, or what can you help him solve, then it, once you figure out your feature set, you can compare uh, like uh, every feature to the problem like if i build that does it solve a problem for my customer if it doesn't don't build it yet unless it brings you traction or anything else and uh, yeah and a good way to know these problems is i'd say don't outsource customer support don't hire someone to do your customer support <laughs> do it yourself as a founder it's the direct line for customers if someone is not happy talk to him uh, talk to all complaints, and yeah. that's how you'll learn the most about uh, problems. Right. On, on that note, I want to add, um, if you do have someone, hopefully not outsource, someone within your team who's dealing with customer support, they're, they're only going to share with you parts of it as well. And, you know, that, that's their job and that's fine. But shadow them. If you have a couple right. of hours, go and shadow them and, you know, listen in on some of the phone calls that they're having or, or watch them interact with some of their customers via email just so you can understand the kind of language that they're dealing with, um, the kind of issues that they're trying to deal with, because they're only going to give you a narrow scope. But if you go and you over here, especially if you're one of the engineers or one of the innovators on the team, you can understand what those problems are and figure out a solution that the person dealing with your, um, or with the issues might not see as well. Right. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think for, for early start, uh, early stage startup is so critical to kind of like listen exactly how, uh, like the users are interacting with your product and uh, seeing what they're saying. So I think what you said about customer support is really critical. Just be in front and, and see what's going on, right? As opposed to like outsourcing it or, or some other solutions. So great. And a, a, good, uh, a good example of that is a few years ago, we had a product like uh, helping optimize and manage parking operations. And on paper, well, not on paper, but on the apps when we were tested, testing them at home, Everything was perfect. The flows were perfect. But then for a couple, two days completely, I went on the ground with actual parking operators using the app and just tried to use it like they did, tried to run things like they did. 
I came out with a document of like 20 thing, 20 feedback. <laughs> like, wh why do I need to keep doing that every time? Or like, uh, you realize a lot of things when you're in front of your customer. Right, yeah. yes. In the, in the shoes. Yeah, yeah you, you basically have to put yourself into their shoes, right? Um, so I think that's, that's, that's really critical. Also, um, you, oh, I'll just add one more thing. If you're launching something in a different geographic region to where you are, it's so important and so crucial to go onto the ground and actually interact with the people who live in that er other area. Um, I was in uh, a launch a few months ago and we were launching in a different country and details like the way the phone numbers are formatted or the way that they input their phone numbers are so different to how we do it right. as well as how they input their addresses that it, you know, that, that list of 20 bugs that Esteban's talking about, it was all just on those two features. And then there were other things on top of that that we also needed to fix. And you only find those things out when you're on the ground. Right. Yes. I think just being out there, I think, yeah, I, I think different countries, I think that's also very challenging too. And understanding their culture values, I think, um, like you said, phone uh, something as simple as a phone number. Uh, like I think that could throw, throw people off, or, or you don't want to piss off people, <laughs> those early users, right? Uh, so I think those are great pointers. Okay, let's talk about um, let's talk about some of your favorite products. Um, like, what do you like, and and why? So I'll. Uh, in I didn't want to name like all the classic ones Slack yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, Uber or whatever. So I'll yeah. go with uh, Front. Uh, if you don't know Front, it's, uh, it's uh, an app to manage like uh, shared inboxes. So emails and uh, all this uh, like external messaging. They raised, I think, 60, 66 million through EB recently. And what I love from there, them, I, I adapted them, I think, three years ago when they were still small. They had probably a tenth of the features they had today, but they had a single thing that was amazing, the user experience. It, like with almost no feature, it just felt so natural. I tried to onboard my team on, I think it's uh, Zen Desk, or I don't know what the name of that tool is. And it took me a week to uh, make them understand how to use the product properly. On front, everyone I onboarded just did things naturally and they didn't need to read anything, they didn't need any tutorial. It just felt right in the flow. And I think that's key. Uh, less features, better UX. And today, well, after a few years, they raised a 66 million and they're taking over the whole market. So wow, that's, that's amazing. Different. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. I just want to double check. Espen, are you talking about France, like F R A N Z? Uh, front app, it's F F R O N T. Oh, okay. It's, uh, okay. okay. Yeah, front app, it's, uh, yeah, it's managing in boxes and everything. Wow, uh, awesome. That's. Awesome. That's pretty funny because I one of my favorite tools at the moment is one called Franz, which is F R A N Z. Okay. And, <laughs> and um, so that's not necessarily for shared inboxes, but it's more like multiple profiles because I have my work profile, I have my personal profile, and then I have my Elixir Labs profiles. And um, this sort of lets me go and connect with all of them in one one window tool, and it's very easy. Like each each different profile is on a different tab. So it's really easy to quickly swap and navigate between them. Right. And, um, and like Esteban was saying, it was just, it's so quick and so intuitive to get set up that um, I, anytime I share out what my tools are with people, I always give that as one of the high right. ones. Um, right. That, that's great. It looks like one of the commonalities between like these great products is having a good onboarding user experience, you know, ha not a lot of friction to use the product. I mean, we see that on Slack too, you know, you just put your email, you're almost there, right? Like, whereas I see startups is like 20 different, like, you know, pages and you go there, it's just like going nowhere. Right. Um, so I think that, I think those commonalities are, are, really good especially for mvp like Stefan said i think uh keeping it as simple as possible and and kind of you know get to the core action of what the user actually w needs to do there i think that's that's very good okay great so uh okay let's talk about uh we have a lot of obviously we have a combination of engineers and well we also have a lot of non-technical founders on our community uh, what advice do you have for non-technical founder when it comes to building products so I'd say it's definitely not easy. Uh, and I, I've <laughs> yeah. talked to hundreds of uh, non-technical founders, especially when I was in my agency uh, building these products. And you get often stuck at a point where 
you need money to build a product with uh, an agency or freelancers, or you need a technical co-founder. And it's kind of a circle because you need a product to get money. You need money to get a product. The so most technical founders get stuck there. I'd say there's a few, of course, if you can find a technical founder, do that. Now, yeah. if you can, uh, try to build value ahead of time to then find a technical founder, find some financing or anything. And by building value, I mean, if you can get a few customers, like again, we come back to building the lending page, find revenue ahead of having a product, right. then this will help you uh, find a founder or some investment to uh, sure. then either just build your product. Right. And go go ahead. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say. I think having like like you said, having that traction is huge, right? Like like even like, like a landing page. If you can go up to someone and say, "Hey, my idea has one thousand signups. Like, are you interested in like learning more?" Whereas as oh, like I just working on this idea randomly, right? <laughs> so I I think people buy that more uh, when having the traction, right? Yeah. And yeah, definitely. And I'll say. And as kind of a second set of feedback is when you're ready to build, uh, like there's a few options. Like sometimes if you just have a bit of money and need a quick prototype, you can always go overseas. I know a lot of people who do that. Right. Just keep in mind, like going overseas, you'll get a product that will work, but the code will be uh, probably really bad and you'll need to throw it away uh, once you really want to scale. But sometimes that works, that's what you need. If you want some quality, you'll pay a bit more here work with any agency that you know will build like a good ground uh, like a good uh, infrastructure for you to scale you can work with some freelancers just know that what you pay for is the quality of what you'll get and right. sometimes it's fine to not pay a lot get a scrappy product get uh, prove your concept and then invest into rebuilding everything from scratch right great i think uh, one of the other things that i want to touch on there is especially because I'm a technical person when I'm right. working with non-technical people, it's the communication aspect is so vital and so important Right. because yeah. it's, I, I can have a technical conversation with the developers on my team and I, I speak their language because I'm also a developer, but um, I, I've seen that interaction where a non-technical person is trying to understand what a technical person is trying to say and both sides have their own language. And I think as a technical co-founder, and you you are a leader in your in your company, and you need to you need to start making that effort um, to try and go out of your way to understand the technical lingo of your of your company. Right. And, yes. And you also need to step out of that box of not just nodding your head and pretending like you understand what's going on, but asking exactly. questions, and asking for clarification. And if you if you identify one or two people who are better at explaining those things to you go and talk to them further because they're like, there, there are some people who are better at explaining and there's some people who, and I know many fantastic, absolutely genius developers who are just not very good at verbalizing what they're talking about. And, um, and if you, if you end up talking to them, it's not going to end well for either. So <laughs> right. I, I, who, who is good at talking and, and, right. talking. and to, to add to that, maybe like there's, it's not for everyone, but there's some amazing resources to, learn code like Le Wagon, Decode Montreal, Lighthouse. Right. Sometimes it's intense. It's a two month boot camp. But if you re if you're motivated, this two months can can get you a sol solid tech expertise to either build a prototype or really understand the people you're interacting with. And uh, of course that's not for everyone, but it's right. always an option to consider or just online uh, courses. Right. I, I think that's, uh, so I think you touched a great point on communication too. I, I think that helps you with recruiting, right? Because yeah. I mean, imagine you're like trying to recruit yeah. like, you know, a technical co-founder event, like you, you're building a web app and you don't know what front end is. You don't know what back end is. You don't know anything about HTML, CSS, you know, like it's kind of hard, but it's also hard to kind of evaluate that technical founder too, right? Because you're in the interview, you're like, oh, like, this is what I'm working on, but I really have no idea about how web apps work. <laughs> so, so it's hard to kind of evaluate them too, yet alone try to communicate with them and try to build a product. Um, so I think those resources in terms of brushing up on like, you know, terminology, whether it's a mobile, web, or whatever it is, right? I think in that kind of specific field, I think would really help with the, with the recruiting aspect too, even down the future too. Like if your company grows and you need more developers, you know, you don't want to just be the non-technical person there has no idea how your web app works. 
um, you know, I think it's kind of looks bad, right? Like, I mean, it's just like you want to recruit well, have good people on board and kind of build a great product. So, um, so I think that those are very uh, key points uh, for our audience to take note. So, uh, great. Uh, so let's chat about um, uh, length of time. So, you know, you got an idea, you want to build your MVP. Um, how long should you spend on building an MVP? Um, like any optimal range you might recommend? I'll let Esteban take it away because again, uh, my nonprofit yeah. projects are very different. <laughs> yeah, that must be long. <laughs> yeah, I, I have two answers to that. It's first answer is as little as possible. <laughs> if you right. can do it in a week, do it in a week. But then the second answer most people would probably want to hear is let's say at volume seven when we were building like MVPs for uh, companies, usually like if you want a fully built product, back end, front end, something that works but it's simple like calculate three to four months and usually you can get to a decent MVP. And that here I'm build, talking about an MVP with a real infrastructure and the, uh, yeah, an actual MVP with, with a product. But also as soon as possible. <laughs> as well. Yeah, I, I think that's the, yeah, the sooner the better, right? Because I see they start up to, you know, you chat with them like eight months later, they still don't have even a landing page. So, so it's like you spend the whole year or even I see them years, like you spend like two years almost trying to build something, you still don't have anything tangible, right? Um, so I think those are good time frames. You can get, you should be able to get a landing page up in an hour, in less than an hour. Yes. And if, you're serious, right. if you're serious about your product, if you're serious about creating that initial customer base, get that landing page up. That will help you with every step, whether it's validating your idea, it's building that initial customer base, it's getting your app out to more people marketing um, it's, you know, or to, to actually show people that you're serious or even to recruit people to come. Um, if you have a landing page, something that you can show potential VCs um, that's, you know, that's what you need. And then in terms of the amount of time you spend, I agree with us, um, it is to some extent depends on the complexity of what you're trying to build. But if you find yourself spending more than let's say three months working on it, then maybe you're working on something that's a little more complicated than, than it should be. Um, I'm going to add the little caveat here of um, if you're working in like machine learning and things like that, where you have to right. train data and training or collecting data and training data, it's taking you three months. That's, that's a separate issue, but right. <laughs> at that point you should be doing what Esteban mentioned earlier, which is um, trying to figure out how to, build the rest of the product and possibly doing some of those steps manually for now as you start collecting all of the data and, and identifying which types of algorithms would work better for your customers. Right. I, I think that's like, excellent. Um, let's talk about the next questions. Uh, I think we talked about this a little bit in the beginning about talking about mistakes in product development. Um, but let's go back for a second. So I see startups too, you know, you have too many bells and whistles for your first version of product. It's like, you know, a thousand feature in there. Uh, but what are some major mistakes you want to avoid making on, on the first version of the product? Make sure it's usable and user friendly. Um, because if I say an idea to you, you're going to, again, going, you're going to, I'm going to say, A, you're going to see B. Right. And, um, for me to actually make sure you and I are on the same page, I need to show you something that, you know, if I say, if you type five here and you hit send, it's going to send me $5. Um, if I can, if I have something that's really quick and simple and easy to use, it's the best way to show that to you. So I think that's one big mistake that I've seen a lot of people do. Yes. And there's just, <laughs> I, I <couldn't laughs> there's too many, right? It's like a thousand. There's, but, yeah. <laughs> there's too yeah, many. I think one that I often see is these uh, stealth startup. And like, I understand if you're kind of uh, serial entrepreneur and have that big revolution, uh, um, revolutionary idea, it might be a sales startup, but in most cases, talk about your startup. It's, oh, uh, that's true. I see many people, I'll, my idea will get stolen, but you're not getting feedback. So just talk about it. No one will steal an idea. It's, it's the execution that's key. So 110% on that. Yeah, I think I agree. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest mistake too. It's like, People, they, they're just afraid of sharing the idea, but, and I tell them all the time, I'm like, the amount of execution you actually need on that, it's like, are you kidding? And somebody tried to like copy it, like forget it. Like 
like I think, uh, like you said, focus on the execution aspect as well. So, um, great. Um, how about uh, this one? Any, would there be any other general advice you might have for our audience in terms of product development? I, I know we've had a lot today, so, but any other <laughs> remaining pointers you'd like to point out? Uh, I, I've said this a couple of times, iterate. Uh, keep keep right. taking feedback and iterate over it and keep improving on your app. Listen to your customers because it's very easy for you to get bogged down with what you want to build and forget that this isn't for you, it's for other people. Great. Awesome. Yeah, definitely, yeah. No, no, yeah, I think we touched most of the points. Awesome, yes. Iteration, UX, uh, just understanding your customer, it really comes, it comes down to that. Awesome. Um, and what resources do you recommend for product development? Uh, do you have any favorite books, blogs you follow? Uh, any resources you might come to mind for product development? Oh, there's this huge list of books. And I'm <laughs> you have? Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, there's, there's actually one book that um, Square recommends we read when we join the company. And right. it's checklist manifesto and okay, yeah. i think it's it teaches you a lot about um trying to trying to create a checklist uh approach to dealing you know essentially how to, a good way of solving the to-do problem or like creating the to-do list and managing it right and uh, i think that that's a really great resource it's a really quick simple read as well um so that's one that i definitely recommend and then follow follow a lot of entrepreneurs that you admire um a lot of them like uh, Wow, I'm forgetting everyone's name right now. Uh, but a lot of them share the books that they're reading as well. And right. usually, you know, if they're people you admire, it's you admire them for a reason. And the kind of books they're reading are what shape the way they think. So you should be reading them too. Awesome. Great. Uh, Stefan, any blogs you follow, Twitter? So, media? Yeah, I don't have any books that come to my mind. But one thing I'd say is when you're using products, any apps you're using, any web apps, take the time to understand, like you go through the onboarding, take the time to understand how they did it. Just kind of uh, bring like uh, analyze everything you use and you'll realize there's some patterns that always come back. Onboarding is always like that, sign up. Right. Just learning from these patterns will help you a lot to build a successful product. Great. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And for our audience that wanna get in touch, ask for the questions, uh, do you guys have social media? I know, uh, you know, I'm on Twitter, I, I follow, so, but um, do you have a social media handle you wanna give out? Yeah, sure. Um, oh, sure, uh, so I'm at Ashni S. Shah, so that's A-A-S-H-N-I-S-S-H-A-H, -A -S -S -H -H, uh, super long. And um, I have the same handle on uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. Those are the three that I share most publicly. And then there's also my website and my blog, which is, um, which are both hosted at ashney.me. Okay, ashney.me. Okay, great. And Stefan, what about your uh, social media? I'd say just, uh, yeah, just contact, uh, add me on LinkedIn. It's uh, usually the easiest I'm posting on LinkedIn. It's uh, uh, slash ES Sanchez. So like, like my last name. But yeah, just search me on LinkedIn and me. Feel free to reach out if you need advice talking about products i always love to talk with startup entrepreneurs and just take a bit of time to learn about your products and uh, help any way i can so let awesome. reach out awesome well uh, i'd like to thank our amazing speakers uh so thank you so much both of you for uh joining us and sharing your knowledge wisdom and expertise uh we look forward to sharing this with our audience and uh thank you so much again